Father, as we continue in our worship, uh, we come to this juncture where we sit and we want to hear from you, Lord. And so, Father, I pray that you would use me as a vessel and that this moment and this opportunity would be where your Holy Spirit speaks and that we would be blessed from this time that we have. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name, amen. Well, we do have some new audio equipment that we're testing out, so if you see Nassim and others bouncing around, we're, we're adjusting to some of the new things that are going on, um, but we're glad that we are moving in the direction of improving those elements of our service. I've been doing a sermon series, if you've been here recently or have uh, participated, um, all about appreciating our Bibles called Your Bible and You. I've been encouraging you to bring your Bibles. Uh, sometimes I enjoy seeing uh, the number of people who are bringing their physical Bibles. Uh, again, I'm not trying to say digital Bibles are, uh, are totally evil. They're just a little evil. Um, but no, <laughs> uh, I think that there's uh, just some familiarity and commonality of having the physical text. But uh, we're trying to emphasize uh, the appreciation of the Word of God um, this week, uh, I'm going through the different analogies that the Bible uses for its own uh, description, and these, this is where we've been, we've talked about the sword of the Spirit, the seed of faith, the light of heaven, last week the bread of life, and today is the power source. And it's obviously almost like a little culmination or summary, uh, today's message, that is kind of combining some of the realities of the previous four. Obviously, these are all references to things that are incredibly powerful. A sword is, is a weapon. It's, it's what you would use in battle. It, was, it served many purposes. It was a source of power. A seed has all of the, the necessary ingredients to grow uh, the plant that is in it. It's enduring, and it's a, it's a powerful reality of our world. The light of heaven uh, obviously a reference to the light and the sun that pours down light. Obviously, the power source of the sun is, uh, is powerful. And then last week, talking about that which feeds us and is nutrients to us and gives us energy and life, the bread of life. So really, it's not a new concept to refer to the Word of God as a power source. And it shouldn't be, a, it shouldn't be necessarily a revelation that the Word of God is not just powerful. It is the power. Do you understand what I'm saying? It's the power. We all know the power of words. That's not uh, anything that requires us to spend a lot of time talking about. There's, we all know how powerful words are. And we all teach our children that little nursery rhyme. You, 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 you learned it growing up. Sticks and stones may break my bones... Oh, even in Liliet's family, she learned that. I don't know what it would be in Spanish. Um, I couldn't have said it better myself. That's right. But words will never hurt me. Now, it's one of those things. It's, it's a nursery rhyme because it's both true and not true. Uh, it's, it's Obviously, we don't want other people's words to define and dictate who we are. We want this word to dictate who we are and what we are. So it's one way of teaching our children, don't worry if Johnny said that on the playground. Don't worry if, uh, if this word came to you and makes you feel bad. You don't need to let that define you. Okay, so, but we also realize that words do matter. Words hurt, words can tear down, words can build up. We understand the power of words. Now, when, uh, oh, the verse that I, I chose to, to introduce this concept of the, the power of the Bible and power of the Word. There's a lot of places we could have went to. Um, I chose the book of Hebrews. And in verse 3, uh, it says this, He, Christ, is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of His nature, and He, ups, he upholds all things by the Word of of His power. He upholds, He sustains all things by the word of His power. Now, I, 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 I try not to get too much on the rabbit trails in my sermons, but there are times when I just can't bypass certain things. The first few verses of Hebrews 
are themselves a beautiful passage of Scripture. Verses 1 through 4. I have a commentary on the book of Hebrews. It's a New American commentary uh, written by David Allen. He spends 150 pages of his commentary just on the first four verses of Hebrews, about a third of his whole commentary. So there's an enormous beauty and, and construction to the beginning verses of the book of Hebrews, even, even the part where it says, by the word of His power, you ask, well, whose power are we talking about? Because he's already talked about Christ is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of His nature. So does He hold up all things by the word of the Father's power or His own power? But if you look at the verse, it doesn't matter. Because Christ is the exact representation of the Father. So if He holds it up by the Father's power, it's the same as His power. You see all of these little tie-ins together uh, to, to give the Bible reader and the Bible student um, something to really reflect on, that Jesus is the Word of God and he, His Word is powerful. But I want you to notice something else too. He upholds all things by the Word of His power. That's how my Bible translates it. Other vi- Bibles are similar. Some are quite different. Um, do you notice that phrase doesn't really flow? He upholds all things by the word of His power. Shouldn't it be the other way around? He holds up things by the power of His word. Wouldn't that be more logical? Thank you. See, this is why I just love new people coming into the church. Lilia, she's right here with me, the rest of you. I'm going to preach right here today. Now, in, in English, we would more likely say the power of the Word, right? He upholds, he upholds things, all things by the power of the Word. He doesn't say that here, though. As a matter of fact, the word for word here is not the normal word like logos word. It's actually the, 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 the word that means to speak a word. It, uh, so, some of your Bibles will say by the command of His power or by the utterance of His power, or by the speaking of His power. And again, this is why commentaries will spend 150 pages on things like this. The kind of bottom idea is it's not just the reading of the Word of God that fills us with power, but the listening to the utterance of God's Word as we read it supplies us with power. You ever wonder how some people read the Bible and they just don't get it? And I'm not trying to say they have to be a theologian or a Greek scholar or anything, but they just say, I don't get that Jesus character and all those nasty passages that say things that I don't like. And, and you just are like, well, why can't you see the beauty that I see? They're reading the words, but they're not hearing the utterance of the power of God. Does that, that's kind of what Hebrews is saying. He upholds all things when you read the word and understand that the Spirit is speaking to you. And in that process, powerful realities become real. Now, I wanted to illustrate, I'm going to use a, an illustration for the majority of my message today, and I was trying to think how to illustrate uh, something that is of enormous power, and I, I, I had all these ideas, oh, I'm going to talk about, you know, a nuclear bomb, you know, and just all the, the power, I mean, that's power, you know, man-made power, of course, and then I thought, well, that's not very natural, not very happy to think about, so let's talk about something natural, and I'm from the Pacific Northwest, um, so I thought, I'm going to talk about Mount St. Helens and how powerful when it, when it blew up in the trees and Spirit Lake was totally, you know, and then, then I thought, well, no, that's kind of a destructive power again. And, and then I thought, well, a black hole, oh, bad, destructive power, I don't, black hole, uh, you know, and my mind went to different areas. And then the Lord kind of shook me and said, you're going the wrong direction. You're talking about the power of the Word of God. Talk about the power of words, not of nature. And so for my kids quiz today, we're going to talk about 19th century word masters. Sounds like a Jeopardy category, doesn't it? 19th century word masters. Uh, I love history and literature, and, and the 19th century was a time of, of enormous growth and outbursts of some of the greatest poetry and sermons. I mean, we were just being born as a country. You have Lewis and Clark and, and the, the exploration, then you have uh, the end of slavery and civil war. And po- so it was an enormous time, and some of the greatest wordsmiths and word masters that have ever lived can be found in the 19th century. So where are my microphone assistants? They're going to grab a couple of mics. Now, what I'm going to do, now, I know we only have uh, 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 so many people here. I'm going to put a picture 
of someone I hope that you can identify. Kids, I want you to tell me who I'm talking about as this is going to lead into the illustration I want to share about the power source and the power of words in the Word of God. I'm going to have a picture, see if you can identify who we're talking about, okay? Okay, Ryden is over here. Jaden is, is racing to your place. Jaden's going to help us out. I, or Jaden's bringing you the mic. And who is this guy? By the way, all of these are word masters. John Muir. Mark, Twa- Mark Twain. He says it's Mark Twain. You are correct. It's, it, it, it's hard not to recognize the guy, isn't it? He's a little bit of an Einstein, you know, the white hair and the, the mustache. There's only really one person that has that, Mark Twain. He didn't have the vocabulary and and things like that, but what he lacked in that he had wit and he had creativity, and there are a few people who have written and had an impact on American society like Mark Twain. Now, this guy, if I didn't know something about him, I wouldn't be able to identify him. He looks a little like Jay and Andrews, but he's not. He wrote Moby Dick. So, I know we have a very intellectual congregation here. I know that you are all advanced students in American literature, and you can really quickly identify who we're talking about here. Is that Patrick? Edgar Allan Poe. That is not correct. (laughs) Edgar Allan Poe is not correct. He wrote the great American novel, Moby Dick. Most significant writing to ever take place on American soil as far as literature goes is Moby Dick. You can argue about that, but I'll I'll argue with you too. Come on now. Some of you know. Help out the kids. Does she want to answer? Okay, right here up front. Oh, she's going to help out. Come on. Nathaniel Hawthorne. It's not Nathaniel Hawthorne. That's the scarlet letter. (laughs) Okay, over here. Walden. I didn't hear it. Walden? Walt Whitman? I didn't hear it. Evandro, did you catch it? Adon? Whitman? Grace, oh. Grace, you tried to help. Jaden, what did he say? He said Herman. Herman! Herman Melville. So they actually go together. He is an intelligent young man. Did you see how he just brought that up. Herman Melville. It is not about a guy chasing a whale, guys. If you've never read Moby Dick, it is the American version of the Divine Comedy or Milton's Paradise Lost. It is an investigation into the human condition uh, and is a very important book. So we're going to move from literature. We're going to move into spiritual things of the 19th century. Anyone know who this person is? Alice Freeman Palmer, Ida B. Wells, Susan B. Anthony, Ellen G. White. Okay, is that Benji? Ellen G. White. Oh, very good. All right. We recognize uh, the messenger of the Lord in the Seventh-day Adventist Church. We're doing well. That is right. Ellen G. White. Now, let's see if you can identify this gentleman. Finney, Miller, Moody, or White. Come on, folks. A little history lesson here. It's good for the soul. I know you know, Toby. All right. Uh, Dylan over here and Eric looks like they're going to work together on it. James White. It's not James White. I fooled you. Okay, Eric. Charles Finney. It's not Charles Finney. Charles Finney preached to more individuals than any other preacher in the 19th century. Again, Nico. William Miller. It is William Miller. Miller was not known as being a word master in his preaching style. But he was known as a word master in his understanding of words. Uh, And so that's why I put him here. Anyone know who this guy is? You might see his face on a piece of copper from time to time. Got to help me out, Jaden. I see hands over here. Is Ezra or? All right. Abraham Lincoln. Abraham Lincoln. I thought you were going to say Buffalo Bill. No, that's Abe Lincoln. All right. And this is the last one. Anyone know who this gentleman is? All right, I see Benji again. 
Booker T. Washington. No, it's not Booker T. Washington. He never had that much hair. Grace, is that you being forced to raise your hand? Frederick. Say his whole name. The, the one under it goes with it. Frederick Douglass. Frederick Douglass. <laughs> that is correct. Thank you, Jaden and Toby. I, uh, I want to tell you a story. I've told you before that uh, I think the world of, of Frederick Douglass, I think he may be one of the most uh, important characters ever to uh, be part of American history and in some ways even in world history. Um, I have made a point to study a lot about his life. And one of the things that Douglass is known for is his ability to use words. We don't refer to it as an orator much these days, but uh, his speaking ability. In 1841, Douglas was obviously, he's born in Delaware and he's a slave. He escapes at the age of 20 and he makes it to Massachusetts. And he has been uh, in the free north for about three years, but he's a fugitive. He's a fugitive slave and he worries, as all fugitive slaves did, uh, that any moment he could be captured and returned to slavery. Um, but he was an adamant participant in the anti-slavery movement. He was completely self-taught, obviously, as a slave. They were not given education, uh, but he taught himself to read. And he carried on his person for much of his early days something called the Columbian Orator. It was a book about how to use words. And he studied it, and he, 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 he knew that if he was going to be effective in, in advocating for the plight of the slave, um, that he would have to use his words to be able to do it. So in 1841, the Massachusetts branch of the Anti-Slavery Society was having a meeting in August on Nantucket Island, right off of, uh, uh, not far from Boston. And he decided to go. He wasn't necessarily invited, but he had already spoken a few times and was somewhat known in the anti-slavery world. And so he decided to go. He goes and there's a thousand uh, uh people there, virtually all of them white. There were three or four black journalists or um, other uh, uh, advocates for anti-slavery that were African-American, but uh, the entire place was, was almost completely white. The organizer of the event, his name was Charles Coffin. He recognized um, the 23-year-old. Oh, wait, anyone here, here 23? My daughter's 23. Oh, Vanessa, my goodness. Any non-liars here today? <laughs> No one's 23 here? Okay, Savannah. I thought it was in that range. He's 23 years old, and uh, Coffin recognizes Douglas. He's not written any of his autobiographies or anything like that yet, but he'd just spoken at a few events. And Coffin said, people, we actually have, we're here to advocate for the slave. We actually have a former slave here. We have Freddie Douglas, and I've asked him to speak. Now, he had made no preparations for this uh, for this moment at all. He thought he was just going to observe and listen and, and, and be like that. And all of a sudden, he is standing in front of a sea of white people. And he writes, um, he says, you know, even though I was in the anti-slavery uh, community here, he said, you have to understand as a fugitive slave that no matter where you go at any moment, the dogs of the slave um, of, uh, People that arrested slaves could be unleashed at you at any time. He says he was terribly nervous, afraid. He said that he worried that people wouldn't be able to hear his words for the knocking of his knees as he shook as he spoke. 23 years old, with zero preparation, he stands up in front of a group of a thousand people and he began to speak. For two hours, Frederick Douglass told his story, and there was not a whisper that could be heard. As a matter of fact, he reflects on it saying, people were so quiet, he thought that maybe he had, you know, lulled them to sleep or something. But you have a thousand people, and many of them are writers and editors and journalists. No one wrote a word. No one spoke. Um, a, a, a journalist afterwards by the name of Lydia uh, China says, that as we listened to Frederick Douglass, flinty hearts were pierced and cold hearts were melted because of his eloquence. She says that even the most ardent advocate for the slave 
held their breath for fear of interrupting him. Douglas himself can't remember what he said. In all three of his autobiographies, he writes, I can't remember what I said. And even though there were a thousand people there, no one else wrote a word of what he said. All they remember is the feeling and the moments of this 23-year-old man. By the way, in this picture, he's about 29. I couldn't find a younger picture that had enough detail that wouldn't look too grainy, but he's very young. Now, one of the things that he was known for saying afterwards and, and uh, uh, is very well credited of saying is he would stand up in a meeting and he would say, I stand before you as a thief and a robber. I stole this head. And I stole these hands. I stole this body. I took them from my master and I ran away. He could just, he could just turn a phrase. What, what happened on Nantucket on August 3rd of 1841, is the greatest voice, the greatest wordsmith for the changing of a nation was introduced and born into American society. Twenty-four years later, Douglas is the most famous African American in the world. His freedom was purchased by the English. After he publishes his first autobiography, he says, I'm an escaped slave, so he couldn't stay in the United States anymore, um, so he goes to England. The English actually raised the money to purchase his freedom. His freedom cost $711.66. It doesn't sound like a lot, does it? But in 1845, I guess that would have 1843 or so when he was purchased. It would have been about $250,000 or so if I've done my math right. They purchase his freedom and he's able to continue. But he is well known in Europe. Tsar Alexander II in Russia has spoken his name. The Chinese and Japanese immigrants in America are writing letters home talking about uh, uh, the American Frederick Douglass, who is arguing even for their equality. Mexicans are talking about Frederick Douglass because he opposed the U.S. war with Mexico in 1849. No one on planet Earth who is African American is better known than Frederick Douglass after 24 years of his work leading up to 1865. And that's where I want to take the story next. So after 24 years of, of him using this gift of speech. And, and you can go on, listen to Morgan Freeman read Frederick Douglass's speeches. They are deep. And remember, this is a serious subject. He never smiles, by the way. Uh, Frederick Douglass is the most photographed individual, not only of the 19th century, but almost more, more photographed uh, up until the digital age than any other person in history. And he did that for a reason. Many of the slaves obviously were illiterate, but if ever they could get a picture of Frederick Douglass, they wanted, he wanted them to see not a smiling, not a frowning person, but a determined, resolute individual. So he is photographed more than Lincoln, more than anyone else. Frederick Douglass is photographed more than anyone else. So his impact is so enduring. And so uh, in 18, and, and forgive me if I'm, I'm jumping around a little bit too much, it's just so much history that I enjoy sharing. Uh, in 1865, Abraham Lincoln is made president for the second time. And in March, he gives his second inaugural uh, speech, probably considered the greatest speech uh, given by certainly an American president, and maybe one of the greatest speeches given, uh, where he talks about with malice towards none and charity to all. He's trying to heal the nation after the end of the Civil War. But at that, uh, on the day of his inaugura inauguration, after he delivers his speech, there was a reception held at the White House for the president, and Frederick Douglass decided to go. He had not been invited. Um, Frederick Douglass and um, uh, Abraham Lincoln were not allies. They avoided each other. They knew of each other, and they'd met before, but Lincoln was, was, was walking this razor's edge during the Civil War of trying to keep uh, all different interests at bay. And he was afraid if he associated himself too much with Frederick Douglass, it may push some of the border states or other advocates for the South into a direction that would have prolonged the war. So he avoided Douglass, but he did respect him. 
And by the way, Frederick Douglass was also very good friends uh, with the Seventh-day Adventist community. He refers to Father William Miller. He, his daughter, Rosetta, becomes a Seventh-day Adventist. Uh, his office was right across the bridge uh, in Rochester, New York, from James White's publishing house of the Review and Herald. They were very, the, the Review and Herald published his eulogy when he died. Uh, so, the Adventism and the work of, of abolition and the work of Frederick Douglass were intertwined uh, uh, from the very beginning. So, in 1865, Douglas decides he wants to visit President Lincoln at the White House at the reception of his uh, second inaugural speech. And Douglas writes something interesting. He says, uh, before he went to the White House, he said, For a while, I had come to the conclusion that I was a man. And again, put yourself in the, the shoes of someone who'd been a slave where they were not really considered humanity. But he says, I had come to the conclusion that I was a man, but for the first time, I felt I was a man among men. In other words, he was feeling a sense, a growing sense of equality with what was happening. So he goes to the White House. Uh, oh, the other thing I want to tell you, George, forgive me about this. You can, um, Frederick Douglass was given the privilege of putting the robe on the Supreme Court justice who replaced the justice who wrote the Dred Scott decision, okay? Taney, the Supreme Court justice who wrote Dred Scott that said slaves were property and they had no rights and they had to be returned, okay, very, very, you know, evil piece of legislation. The Supreme Court justice, his name was Salmon Chase, who replaced him, Frederick Douglass was invited to his chamber to put his robe on him for the very first time. Just imagine the juxtaposition. It's just... Don't you love history, Yvondra? Why aren't you smiling like I am? Anyways, I keep getting sidetracked on my story here. Douglas goes to the White House in March of 1865. He wants to see if he can meet the president. He's turned away. The police officers that were guarding the door uh, told him he could not enter, but someone recognized him and said, are you crazy? This is Frederick Douglass. Of course we want to let him in. Douglas says within moments he found himself alone with the president in the west wing of the White House. Again, Lincoln and him had met before, but they had not really... Um, a close relationship because of the nuances of the war. Lincoln speaks with Douglas for a little while, and then Lincoln turns to Douglas and he says, I want to know what you think of my speech that I gave today, his second inaugural speech. And Douglas demurred. He said, uh, you don't have time. Uh, you know, you're a busy guy. Um, I don't want to waste your time uh, by talking with about it. And Lincoln stopped and turned to Douglas and said this, there is no other man whose opinion I value more. Please, tell me what you think. And for Douglas, it just, Lincoln called him a man. Said, you, your opinion means more than anyone else's. And so Douglas, of course, told him, I thought the speech was great. And a month later, Lincoln is dead. But the work of Frederick Douglass and his ability with words changed not just a nation, but changed humanity's view towards humanity. The greatest speaker I think God raised up for such a cause that could ever be hoped for was found in Frederick Douglass. The power of words, the power to use words to change lives. It is worthy of us to remember people and these individuals and these moments to remember that we hold in our hands something far more powerful than even Frederick Douglass's words or Lincoln's words, more powerful than Ellen White's words. You are holding the most powerful thing in all creation when you hold the Word of God. It is the power source. I thought of this verse in thinking of Douglas, like apples of gold 
in settings of silver is a word spoken in right circumstances. Like apples of gold and settings of silver. There are many lists and descriptions that can be made to illustrate the different ways in which the Word of God fills us with power. We're very familiar with the reality that God's Word creates. One of the most, you can look all over the Scriptures, all kinds of verses, by the Word of the Lord, the heavens were made, and by the breath of His mouth, all their host. But God's power and the power of His Word doesn't just create the world. It also creates things in us. It creates hope. It creates purpose. It creates courage. It creates that which we need. God's Word creates. The devil wants to destroy, but God's Word creates. And He wants to create in every single one of us. God's Word heals. It heals. Psalm 107, He sent His Word and healed them. And the, the centurion in Matthew chapter 8, who He said, come heal my servant. And Jesus said, I'll, okay, I'll come and heal your servant. He says, no, you don't need to come. Just speak the Word and my servant will be healed. Where is healing found? It's found in the Word of God. Healing for our souls, healing for our nation, healing for our families. Creating me a clean heart, David cried out. Heal me. And in the Word of God, you will find the healing that you need for your soul. God's Word guides there's many passages. The unfolding of your words gives light. It gives understanding to the simple. How many times does the devil try to confuse us, try to divide us, try to lead us in ways we don't want to go? When you have the power source in your hand, God's Word will guide you on the path He wants you to take. God's Word creates. God's Word heals. God's Word guides, and don't underestimate the power of God's Word to save. That's really the only power that matters. Your salvation is found in the power source that is the Bible. God has poured out His character, His spirit, His love, His mission, and His mercy is found not just in the reading of His Word, but in the listening to the Holy Spirit and the utterances spoke by God as you read His Word. God's Word saves. Those beside the road are those who have heard then the devil comes and takes away the word from their heart so they will not believe and be saved. God gives us the word so that we can have the assurance and the hope of eternal salvation. You would think, if we really believe these things, you would think we would be all the more anxious to cherish this power source. That we would dedicate ourselves to a much higher degree of embracing and studying and learning, memorizing the Word of God. But we know that the distractions of life are certainly powerful as well. And the obstacles that the devil puts in our life keeps us from the Word. I think we all go through these. Hopelessness, weakness, confusion, 
discouragement. All those things can be addressed and reversed by applying ourselves to be students of the Word of God. I know you've heard it before. I know I'm not saying anything you haven't probably thought of or heard in, in dozens of uh, sermons and studies in your walk. I just think it's a worthy reminder for us as Christians, as Seventh-day Adventists, that we listen to the power of God's Word because we need it. If you think you can walk this world and be successful and avoid all the pitfalls and trials that the devil puts on our path by only having a limited, meager approach to God's Word, I think we're in trouble. The power source is in our hands. Again, going back to Hebrews, right back to where we started. In these last days, God has spoken to us in His Son, and He upholds all things by the word of His power. Do you need power today, guys? It's here. He doesn't hide it. Sometimes it takes work, it takes effort, it takes investment, it takes time. But everything you need for your success and your happiness and your hope is in the Word of God. Don't neglect it. Don't miss out on it. Apply yourself to every opportunity and you will not ever, ever regret it. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, um, just bless us, Lord, not for our sake, but because we need it. And it is so easy to get forgetful. It is so easy to, to uh, procrastinate. But Lord, help us as we go through the chaotic day in which we live, and as we see more and more challenges on every horizon, as we see a divisiveness in our society that, that threatens to uh, just tear us apart, Lord, and as we realize that as we go into the last days, things are not going to get easier, that the devil is not just on the sidelines, that there is, is great challenges uh, ahead for us as believers. And as you have, have made that clear as we study your Word, Father, I pray that we would make your Scriptures our daily meal, that it would be our sword that we cherish and we carry and we maintain, that it would be the seed that was planted deep inside of us that grows with vibrancy and with provision. It would be the light that pushes away the darkness and shows us exactly who you want us to be and the direction you want us to go. Father, help us to cherish this beautiful, powerful source that you've given us. There is no other power that can do what your word can do. Thank you for the illustrations that we can see in history. Thank you for the transformational things that happen uh, when people are, are gifted in, in using the word. But help us to be reminded that those things should draw us to your word because it is the source that we need for the power in these last days. We pray this in Jesus' name and for His sake. Amen. Well, thank you for being here today. I hope that you come back this next Sabbath. George Malara will be preaching, isn't that right? And so he's going to have a wonderful message, and we will be, uh, my wife and I will be back the week after that. We uh, hope that you have a wonderful rest of your Sabbath and a good week. God bless.